be aware of a lot of the issues around these kind of technologies and how they're used, especially by police and, and um, borders and stuff. There's just very many unknowns in a technology that's rapidly coming into society, not only by police, but also by, for instance, voice identification on your phone, in shops, all of these other places. It does give you a strong sense of being surveyed, which kind of... I don't know, it can make you feel like you've done something wrong. When biometric data is used for the purposes of uniquely identifying someone, it has this higher um, sensitivity. But how is it used? And how do you feel about that use? How can we all, that's you guys, civil society, us as regulators, law enforcement bodies, how can we all work together to make sure we get the best outcome? Biometric data is fundamentally different to data such as the address you live at or your email address because it's much more intimately connected. Once, once your face is digitized and recognizable and on file somewhere, you can't change it. I'd far rather give someone my fingerprint than give someone my face, because, you know, as a record, because the face feels far more personal. It's something that we're using to uh, recognize biometric data um, amongst ourselves, you know, continually when we're talking to people. One of the massive things is there's not not enough protection for the individual. Markets and the governments have got more power than we have. Uh, presentations were all relatively nuanced, so everybody takes a different position in the field and have different opinions, but they presented it as neutral as possible to the groups raising their own concerns. So it's really important that digital age, identity and biometrics are all things that are developed that anybody can use. It should be something that, is a, that helps an individual be in more control irrespective of that individual's background, race, orientation, gender, ethnicity. This should be something that is used positively for all. It should not exclude parts of society. We don't want to stop the police using biometric data to keep us safe. These are all good things. But it's about how can we get the balance right? Because it's all about the individual's rights and protecting those. When they're you know, using a fingerprint or facial recognition, they're generally aware that this is you know, some information about them is being used to do this. But I think sometimes they may not necessarily always capture what potential consequences of using that information would be, but also what their rights over that information are. I would like a lot more clarity about what happens to the data. Even though that I can see the positives for, for, using, for, for the use of biometrics, that in itself is a, is a reason for for being here. I do have a very strong, genuine personal interest in public engagement, particularly engagement which goes beyond shallow headlines where you get really genuine feedback as well, but informed feedback because I've had the opportunity to hear about the depth of complicated issues. I was aware that there was legislation, but seeing how how large that was and how fractured it was and how there are so many organisations with different pieces in the puzzle. I think it's really good to hear that there are so many well-intentioned people working with this technology trying to make sure it works for society and works for everybody. That's been really great. The public will be asked to really set their red lines, set their kind of conditions and their expectations when it comes to biometrics. I was wondering like how like processes like this are like made to get legislation like who decides and like it's us <laughs>
to the biometric council and they picked it apart and this was this question is what they they came up with and it really illustrates the importance of that dialogue and that process if we the Ada Lovelace Institute had determined in isolation what that question was then we would have missed the richness and almost the conciseness of, the, of that really interesting question. So um, it's really in that spirit that we're introducing the findings of this work. Um, what I want to do is obviously to, um, I've given you a bit of an overview of this session, and also the spirit and form in which we want to undertake this discussion. But I also just um, uh, have to put a few housekeeping messages in before we actually begin the conversation. So the, the, the first is that we have closed captioning available and um, that's available for everyone. So you can just, um, you know, uh, identify that on your menu bar and, and, and click on the button closed caption. Um, you can ask questions using the Q&A section. And um, if you want to tweet about this event, then you can tweet at Ada Lovelace Inst. Um, with a hashtag biometrics council and, and follow all the other tweets about this. Um, so I, I don't really want to talk too much about me or um, any of that. I, I, I think I just want to let this outstanding panel um, speak for itself. So we have Aidan Heppin, who's senior researcher and um, public engagement at the Ada Lovelace Institute. And Aidan has really been um, instrumental in stewarding this process and, 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 and ensuring um, that, that uh, we do justice to the work of, of, of the Biometric Council. We have Ali Shah, um, who was a, a crucial uh, part of this process. He, he was on the oversight group, which is a, a group of experts assembled to ensure the independence and the integrity of, of, of the information commissions, uh, sorry, of, of the contributions of the participants um, and, and, and the process. And um, he's been part of the Information Commissioner's Office, um, who've been really useful and helpful in terms of championing this, this process and we're really um, delighted to have Ali with us today. And then we have two members of, of the council um, who have participated by spending uh, just over 60 hours of their time thinking about this. So we are talking about real, you know, experts by experience, but also people who um, have thought about this probably more than many other people uh, who are joining us today. So we're really delighted to hear from them as well. So we've got Alistair Clark and we've got Gemma Roberts um, and they will be drawing upon their own experience in the process in, and, and, and unpacking a little bit more um, what it is that we seek to do and, um, and what they want to achieve when it comes to legislation and policy in this, in this landscape. Um, so I really think that this is a central part of the way we do public engagement at the Ada Lovelace Institute. It's central because it matters in our convening diverse voices, but it also matters in terms of um, addressing asymmetries of power. Um, so thinking about how do we create a broad debate, a broad societal debate when it comes to biometric policy. Um, so without any further ado, I am going to hand to Ali Shah, um, who will say a bit about the landscape and why um, he and the Information Commissioner's Office um, thought this was really important. Over to you, Ali. Thank you, Rima. Hello, everyone. Really nice to join you all uh, on this webinar. Um, as Rima said, I'm Ali. My, my job is Head of Technology Policy at the UK Information Commissioner's Office. We're the UK regulator for data protection, personal data. Uh, and my role and my team's role is to really think about the use of biometric technologies and how they interact with your personal data and how do we make sure your rights are protected. So we've been involved in this work from the get-go. I want to just quickly start by, you know, really applauding the work of Ada Lovelace um, and all of the team, Aidan, Henrietta, and everyone who has really um, championed the work of the council through a very difficult period of the last 12 months. I think, you know, it's it worth just taking a second to really say how wonderful it was to see how the team adapted to making sure that this important conversation kept happening and that the important findings of, of the council were brought through to this report so that we can all discuss them today. I think Rima so asked me to just give a, a little bit of a context of why do we care? And, and I think we care because these technologies are developing so quickly and we are on, at one level already used to them, you know, whether you're logging into your phone or your laptop or you're starting to see cameras uh, in our streets, you, it feels like we're already used to them and we're seeing use cases from fingerprint login through to live facial recognition being used. But on the other hand, it's also developing really quickly. So we're seeing new techniques and technologies being 
brought to market and being used in lots of different ways that we had never expected before. And that pace of technological development with the fact that this data is so intimate and it's really some of the most intimate data that you can really capture means that it's important that we really deliberate over what this means for all of us as citizens. And I think it's with this point in mind that we should recognize how complex this debate is and how complex these issues are. There are so many potential benefits to these sorts of technologies, but how do you balance those and reconcile those against dealing with some of the issues and the harms that might arise? How do you make sure people understand what's happening with their data? How do you make sure that people feel like they have control over that data and their interests are being put at the heart of this debate? And I think this complexity is really difficult to navigate through. It can feel like a Gordian knot sometimes. How do you cut through it? I think that's where the work of the council has been really instrumental. You, know, you have really brought some authoritative reflective consideration to this question. I think the report shows that. It shows the, the frankness and the directness of the recommendations of the analysis. And I think you're helping to cut through what is such a, a convoluted area by providing policy makers like me and others with insights that we can go and work on and try and make sure that your interests are represented at the heart of this. Um, I don't wanna finish before also thanking all of you. Uh, and I want to do this, if you'll indulge me, in a roundabout way. Um, in a previous life, I used to work in the media. Um, my early training, you know, a decade or two ago, was to go out on the streets and gather vox pops. Um, little interviews uh, to just get voice, uh, get some public commentary around a breaking news story. And vox pops, as you'll know, is vox populi, it's voice of the people. And it was, it was about more than a snippet or a soundbite for that day's news agenda. It was about making sure that the voice of the people was at the heart of the debate. And I think the work of the council is really vox populi. It really is bringing the voice of the people to the heart of a very important policy debate. So for my part and for the information commissioner's officer's part, we're really going to be reflecting on your report and all of your deliberations, all of the hard work you've put in to drive our thinking around what we should do within our remit and where we are setting policy or guidance. I can absolutely guarantee you and promise to you that your report and your findings are really informing our thinking and what we'll be doing next. Thank you, Rima. With that, I'll pass back to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll now hand over to Aidan, who will be um, introducing the key themes of the report, and then Gemma and Alistair will be unpacking a bit more in detail some of those key themes and, and in particular reflecting on their experiences. And it's been an interesting series of experiences, I, I must say. Um, we, we've, we've handled a pandemic and we've, we've handled Storm Kiara, um, so, so there's some stories to tell about, about this, this process and I'm really proud of everyone for, for sticking with it. It's just an extraordinary achievement to get to this stage. Um, so uh, well done to everyone. And, and, and Aidan, I'm, I'm handing over to you now. Thanks so much, Rima. I will just uh, pop up some slides to help talk through the kind of the what and the why and the how of Citizens Biometrics Council. I just want to say, um, uh, share my thanks to, to Ali for joining and giving us that background there and Alistair and Gemma for not only taking part in this session but for taking part in the council and of course um, for everyone for, for coming along and listening to this session today. Um, so be before I dive into the um, Citizens Biometrics Council, what we did and, and why we did it, um, I just want to start by kind of um, talking through a little bit of the prior work that Ada Lovelace Institute did that made the foundations of the council. So in 2019, we called for a moratorium on future public and private sector deployment of facial recognition technologies until the societal and legal conditions for its responsible and proportionate use were established. Um, and shortly after that, we published a survey of over 4,000 UK at, um, adults' attitudes to facial recognition. And this survey showed us, among many things, um, that there was not sweeping public acceptance for these kinds of technologies. And there are a huge number of unanswered questions um, about public, public perspectives and public values in relation to things like facial recognition and other biometric technologies. So this, the survey kind of really confirmed to us that there was urgent need for a much more nuanced understanding of, of public perspectives on this issue and a space for public voice in this debate. Um, and where, where, the, where, where the survey was invaluable for understanding the pulse of the nation's attitudes, we wanted to make space for that, for that deeper dialogue. So our aim with the um, Citizens Biometrics Council 
was to develop an understanding of an informed public's expectations, conditions for trustworthiness, and red lines when it comes to the use of biometrics technologies and data. And within that aim, we also wanted to broaden the scope of this discussion beyond just facial recognition to cover a range of emerging biometric technologies, including voice recognition, novel types of digital fingerprinting, and much more. And we also wanted to create space for members of the public to articulate their own conclusions and recommendations. That was really important to us in this work. And we wanted to amplify the voices of underrepresented and marginalised groups do this work, and I'll talk a little bit more about that aspect in particular in detail um, in a moment. So the methodology we chose to, to meet the same was that of a deliberative mini public, which is a category of methodologies that often includes things like citizens panels, citizens councils, juries, assemblies. For the Citizens Biometrics Council, we convened 50 members of the public from a diverse range of ages, genders, ethnicities, socioeconomic backgrounds, political leanings, and with varied perspectives um, towards data and digital technologies. And we took that group of people um, through more than 60 hours of facilitated workshops where they considered a range of evidence. Um, they heard from experts from industry, public sector, the police, academia, civil rights groups, and more. And through those workshops, um, the council members were, were kind of guided through the topics, given space to explore them, ask their own questions, really become experts and consider and discuss the depth and breadth of issues relating to biometrics technologies, things like privacy, surveillance, discrimination, and, and, and a whole load more that it would take um, 60 hours to talk through um, everything that kind of went on in those 60 hours of deliberation. Um, so um, as Rima mentioned, in our early discussions with the council members, we talked through the aims of the council, we talked through the topic, and um, we agreed that the, the question that um, the council would address was this one, what is or isn't okay when it comes to the use of biometrics technologies? Um, and that really is the question that the council's recommendations in the report answer. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about the workshops where we, where we unpacked that question in just a moment. But before I do that, I want to talk about some really key elements of the design of this project. The first um, were our community voices groups. So we knew from our own survey and from, our, from the broader research literature around biometrics technologies that the harms caused, um, or the, the harms that could be caused by misuse of some of these technologies, disproportionately fall on marginalised groups who are often underrepresented in these kinds of debates. And that includes in particular um, minority ethnic groups, people who identify as LGBTQI and people who are disabled. So to ensure the council amplified those perspectives, we convened three community voices groups, one for each of those demographics. And each group had around eight to 12 people, and they met once before the council's main workshops began to um, inform the entire process's design and make sure that the right topics were on the table for discussion. And then those groups also met at the end of the workshops to feedback on the overall findings and recommendations. And some members of each of those groups also took part in the main council process. So it was a way of making sure that we had that extra amplification for voices that are, would otherwise um, risk being excluded from this discussion or have been excluded in the past. Um, another really important aspect of this process were our expert speakers and oversight groups. So as Rima mentioned, um, the oversight group consisted of, of experts um, from regulatory, industry, academic, uh, policing and data ethics backgrounds, and their task really was to steer the whole project by helping us bring um, uh, not just a range of evidence, but a balanced range of evidence to the council, and also identify the important cases and questions to discuss in workshops. So they really were a kind of anchor for the expertise that fed into the council. Um, and then in addition to the, to the oversight group, we also had a, a number of expert speakers drawn from a huge spectrum of actors in the biometrics landscape who came and spoke to the council. So these were people um, that, that, that ranged from those in technology industry, developing, designing, deploying biometric systems, right the way through to those researching or even campaigning against them. So a whole, a whole range of perspectives for the council to engage with. And these expert speakers came to our workshops um, throughout, throughout the process and they presented the council and they discussed topics with them. And um, for me, one particular highlight of the project was that quite a few of those expert speakers reported the tough grilling they got from, from council members, particularly in the later stages of the process, um, where we were really starting to, to strengthen the group's knowledge on this topic. And that's you know, a testament to, to Alistair and Gemma and everyone else on the council for asking really um, fantastic questions to those experts. Um, so we designed the council around a series of three weekend long workshops. So the first weekend um, was about getting to grips with what biometrics technologies are, getting everyone on, on roughly the same page about the kinds of issues we were talking about and exploring some of the existing debate around these technologies, existing or potential uses and the kind of benefits that they bring, but also the harms or the concerns that they may also cause. 
The second weekend got much more into the depth of those ethical issues surrounding biometrics, gave lots more space to consider evidence and discuss with experts. And then the third weekend um, kind of continued exploring those ethical issues, but also started to think about the policy landscape that we're in and then regulations, oversight, those kinds of things. Um, and then the, that final workshop also brought the council together to form their conclusions and their recommendations. Now, originally, um, the, the workshops were planned to take place in February, March and April um, 2020 with homework activities in between. They were going to be in person in, in lovely community spaces in um, Bristol and Manchester. Um, but of course, uh, the, the UK went into lockdown literally halfway through this process. Um, we, we were kind of midway between the, the, the middle weekend of workshops when um, we, we had to postpone the, the council. And uh, initially, our hope was that we could reconvene in the autumn. Um, but obviously that, that turned out to be quite a naive hope and reconvening in person um, wasn't going to be possible. Um, but we also didn't want to indefinitely postpone the council, um, not only because we felt the work was really important in that moment, um, but also as life was becoming ever more digital, we felt that the council, the question the councils were discussing and the issues they were, they were considering were only becoming more salient and more important as society kind of moved online during the pandemic. So we adapted the workshop design still based on that structure of three weekends, but so that it would work via Zoom um, in a series of kind of shorter sessions in evenings and weekends. And in truth, at that time, doing public deliberation online was quite a novel prospect. Um, so I, I Kind of want to take a moment to share my gratitude with the team at Hopkins Van Mill, who we worked with to deliver the council um, for, for, for not only their kind of creativity and, and their flexibility in adapting the workshops to work so well online, but also for being among the organisations that were really trialling and pioneering ways to do effective, rich and robust public deliberation in an online environment. And, and ultimately, um, we, we restarted the workshops in line uh, online late last summer. Um, and then wrapped up the council workshops in October with the final community voices session in early December. And I think the output um, really bears, you know, it, the fact that we went online bears no impact on the output. It's still an incredibly valuable set of findings and the council did fantastic work to fit Zoom calls in in their evenings and weekends and around everything else that was going on last year. So, so my gratitude to all the council members. Um, but at this point, I've been talking um, for, for much too long about the what, the why and the how of Citizens Biometrics Council. So I, I'd really like to take a moment to hand over to Alistair um, and, and Gemma, who participated in the council workshops from start to finish, um, who can share their experiences of being part of that process and some of the important topics um, from, from their perspective. So um, I'll hand back to Rima to, to, to pass over once again. Thank you, everyone. Absolutely. And um, so I think I'll turn first to Gemma. And, and, and ask you, um, I mean, you participated in, in both strands, the, the deliberation, but also the community voice workshop. So I was wondering whether you might be able to reflect on what the process was like, how it iterated, evolved, any kind of top takeaways um, for, for engaging people in some of these conversations and, and, and how you found it. Um, and also some of the most important things that you felt um, policymakers should should um, pay attention to. I think we've got some really thoughtful and rather influential people here. So it's your opportunity to get those um, perspectives uh, of the council in front of us. Thanks Rima and thanks everyone for having me here today. I really enjoyed working with the uh, Biometrics uh, Council and I just wanted to sort of share my experience with you all today. So uh, my name's Gemma, I'm a member of the Citizens Biometrics Council, but I also identify as a disabled person. Um, I work for an organisation called Greater Manchester Coalition of Disabled People, which is a disabled persons organisation, 100% run and controlled by disabled people. I started engaging with this through the community voices, like we were, like we'd mentioned previously in this meeting. Um, and I joined with the intention of representing disabled people's views on technology because often they go misrepresented or underrepresented in this field. So that's why I applaud Ada for doing the work that they have done. Um, personally, I think technology has a really good impact on my life and biometrics technology. I feel it really helps the way I can access things in life and it really helps um, different sort of um, access needs that I have with that. It's partly why I chose to be on the council um, because I can see how the technology can improve the lives of so many people. Um, however, 
coming to these council meetings made me realise that technology isn't always the answer to everything because many different communities can't access it for various different reasons. And again, this is why I commend Ada for doing this research right from the very beginning, because um, it's important that we get biometrics right from the very start and we also make it very inclusive to everybody and not sort of exclude anybody in that process. Um, I think sort of the main with the process, like uh, was mentioned before, I sort of got involved at the community voices section um, and then we met maybe once or twice in the community voices section. And then I had quite um, big contacts with sort of Aidan um, and the people at Hopkins Van Mill. Um, and then we were able to sort of discuss about joining the biometrics council. Then is when we started sort of meeting every, well, it was meant to be every month, sort of like Aidan was saying before, but then it was sort of more weekly online sessions. And I found the change from sort of meeting in a community space to meeting online was different. It wasn't the same sort of atmosphere as what it was sort of in, in person. However, I think you did a really, really good job of delivering it online. And it did feel like we were together, even though we were all in our separate homes because of the way it was organized and the way it was delivered. Um, I think sort of what I want to talk about now really is to just talk about sort of the three main findings that sort of came out from the session from the Biometrics Council that held something personal to me. Um, so the first one that um, came up was the theme of consent. So the, we discussed about sort of biometric data and getting your consent to use biometric data. And we learned from a variety of different experts in the field about where your data goes, how it's stored, and who can potentially access that data um, once they have got hold of that data. Um, we also looked at the ethics of that as well, and we started thinking about sort of what is the difference between using biometric data and using just your regular online data that you would use to get into Facebook or to get into Instagram, so like email and password. And what we came to the conclusion was that um, basically if, you, if your data gets passed on as biometric data, then there's no way you can change that. Whereas you can with sort of like a Facebook or an email password or something like that. So consent was the main sort of thing that came from this. And we thought that people really needed to be able to consent fully to know where all their data was going to be shared or all their data was going to be kept um, on themselves because it is very personal in comparison to say, when you have an email address and password. Um, and we also discussed how consent needs to be quite clear. It needs to be um, a case of it could be made in different accessible formats for different people. It needs to be made in different languages. It needs to be made sure that you know exactly what you're agreeing to before you sort of agree to it. The second point I wanted to raise that sort of brought a lot for myself as well was the bias and trust issue. So we sort of had a look at a lot of different technologies and a lot of how AI works and how there is inbuilt sort of bias into AI and how that could potentially be addressed. Um, I think just to sort of keep it quite short on this one, really, um, what we didn't want to sort of allow these biometric technologies to do was feed on the inequalities and the prejudices that already exist in society. And we learn a lot about how these technologies learn from the society that is around at the moment. And we wouldn't say society is in a great place for this technology to be learning from at the moment. And that's an example of say, if you need facial recognition and you have darker skin, then it's probably not gonna be able to recognize you as accurately as somebody who has lighter skin. Um, also, if you are disabled and you have some form of disfigurement on your face, then it also probably won't recognize you the same way as if you were a non-disabled person to do that. So I think it's really important to sort of keep those points in mind when we think about going forward with biometric technology and thinking about 
that they need to be addressed before we go any further with it. And then the final thing uh, with the sort of findings and recommendations is the oversight or overseeing bodies. So as Ali was here, Ali came and talked to us in some of our sessions to talk about the oversight and governing bodies. Um, and from what we found out in the council is actually there seems to be quite there's a few different people who can sort of oversee what's going on in biometric technologies. However, they don't seem to be as connected to each other as what we would have liked to have seen in the council. Um, and they don't seem to be able to have the, the same powers as what say a police force could have as well. So if that's the case of biometric data data has been breached and your data has been passed on to somebody, there's no sort of accountability um, like there would be with GDPR rules and also that the current GDPR rules don't sort of keep up to date with what's going on with biometrics technology. So we would recommend that somebody, there would be an oversight body that could sort of see over this and they could also um, sort of keep an eye on what's going on. And also we sort of recommended something like the Biometrics Council, where it is regular people who are able to have a look at the ethics of why this technology is needed or why a particular organisation feels it would benefit them. Um, and also that body would then be in control of whether that technology in that organisation is meeting that criteria or whether it's going against it and actually selling your data onto private companies, which, you know, we, we were all against that in the council. So I think sort of just to finish off um, and just sort of summarise everything about what we've just talked about there. So I just wanted to say that I really did enjoy my time with the Biometrics Council. It felt really exciting to be at the forefront of discussions around new technologies. And it's been really interesting to then hear these discussions then come to the mainstream media as well. So I was listening to a radio show the other day and they were talking about um, police using facial recognition in body worn cameras and I actually found myself arguing with the radio because the people were ringing in giving their opinions and not well I felt they didn't really know about it um, and it just feel like this council gave us that extra oomph behind what we were saying to know a lot more about what we were doing um, and I think it shows that basically Ada uh, has given us some very long lasting knowledge to then take this forward and use it in our personal lives if anybody ever asks about it. But that's about it for Much. me. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I just want to say that the points around bias and exclusion and, 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 and you know, what we are describing as the data divide, that's something that we're thinking about a lot um, and, and it's always great to, to be reminded of how important that is and similarly I, I share um, you know your well I mean as, as somebody with, with hearing aids I, I share some attitudes around technology the kind of importance and value of it but also ensuring that that design and uh, we get the design of, of, of it right and and, and um, think, think very carefully about how it's implemented in very sensitive areas such as this. Um, Alistair, I, I want to turn to you and, and ask you um, about your experience, um, how you found it, um, and also any sort of reflections. And again, this point, which is what are the key things that you would want policymakers, influential policymakers to think about um, going forward? And also some, some developers, I think we've got some developers in this room as well. Um, so over to you, Alistair. Uh, thank you, Rima. Uh, just to say hi to everyone. Uh, I'm 38 years old and I took part in the uh, Bristol Biometrics Council. And I have to admit that I didn't really know much about biometrics before I joined the council. You know, I knew about the passports, fingerprints, everything like this. So only the basic things, really. So I think, you know, it was quite good to actually go into this council not knowing really what to expect. So I went there with wide, you know, wide eyes open and just to, learn, just to listen to what was going to be involved, what, you know, what would I have to say, what would I have to do. So it was quite interesting just to see a wide variety of organisations that were invited to come along and give their 
information, their input and their opinions and what they actually plan to do in the future for biometrics. So I think when, you know, seeing something from somebody like some Big Brother UK, actually just to see the surveillance, you know, what is actually being used on us or what is, you know, the technology is there already and what the future involves. I think that was quite interesting. And then all the way to a private company like Toyota, I think it was a, you know, the identif identification app or something like that. So that was interesting to see the, the, the private side of things and where that, you know, where your biometrics are going to be used and how they're going to be used. So I think it was quite interesting to see, hear about the Big Brother UK, to see the police, you know, so doing surveillance on you without you realising. And I, th I think, to be honest, when I heard that, I was a bit taken aback, really. I was like, well, why is this happening? I haven't given permission to actually give my biometrics. So, where, you know, where's the ethical side of things on there? But then also when I looked at the Yoti side of things, where they're a private company and wanting to make money, I was also thinking, well, if I give you my permission, that's fair enough. But if you're actually just taking my my information without actually asking me and then profiting from it, I think that is a different thing altogether where you're making money from my data without me giving permission. So I think what I took from the council is, I think there needs to be discussions on the your information and uh, you know what how much information you're going to take from me and if I'm going to give you permission to do that so therefore I think I think you need to actually uh, I'm trying to think of the wording uh, I think yeah if you're giving permission to a company like a private company to Yoti then that's absolutely fine you are giving permission but I think if they actually have your permission then they actually have your information what are they going to do with it how they're going to store it how long they're going to store it for and what are they going to use it for and if they sell it on to other companies that's another bigger issue so i think it's a big big uh, challenge where uh, your information is going to be uh, what's the word yeah what what is your information going to be used for that is the prime concern for for myself for private companies why are they going to use it Policing, I can understand it, especially now in Bristol when you hear about those protests as well. So that's quite relevant, really, I suppose. But I think, yeah, questions need to be asked. And I think regulations need to take place on what are the companies going to be using your private information for? So I think that's one of my main conclusions, really. Thank you. And um, that's, that's up. I start pretty neatly for um, Aidan to just recap on some of the key themes, um, uh, one of one of them being regulations. So Aidan, I'm just going to, to to turn to you to to talk through those key themes, and then um, I, I I would also encourage people to think about their questions. We've got a few already in the chat, so that's great to see. If you've got any any more, then do do pop them in fairly early because uh, it feels like we're we're going to have to cover them fairly fairly quickly. Um, so do do pop them in. I, I think I'm going to take a first come first served approach to those questions. Um, Aidan, over to you. Thanks, Rima, and, and I'll be brief both because I want to make time for for, for that Q and A, but also because I think um, Alistair and, and Gemma have have covered uh, the topic of, of what the important parts of the the council's findings were so, so, so fantastically, and I think that gives students a bit of an insight of the kind of level of conversation we were having at some of those workshops. So imagine that, but for 60 hours across a series of months, and it gives you a bit of a picture of, of, of the process the council went through. Um, so I just wanted to kind of briefly um, just reflect a little bit more about how the recommendations were developed. So um, as I mentioned in that final session, um, we asked the council members to break into groups and come up with ideas of what they think could help answer that question of what is or isn't okay when it comes to the use of biometrics. And this generated uh, a set of 24 incredibly rich and detailed recommendations in total. And you can read all of those recommendations in the report. I won't put them on a screen here because um, they're, like I said, they're quite, they're, they're quite dense and full of detail. Um, but what we did was rather than try to take that set of 24 recommendations and condense them down into a subset or a kind of summarized set of recommendations and risk losing all of the kind of nuance and, and um, richness that was in those, we instead kept the full range of statements. Um, the idea being that, that gave us a, a better reflection of everything that the council had managed to discuss through their, through their workshops and the, the, the range of things that they wanted to consider and 
um, in their conclusion. So in the report, you can see all those recommendations grouped together under a handful of themes, which includes um, regulation, legislation, oversight, data management, proportionality, uh, bias, discrimination and accuracy, consent and opt out, transparency, th th these things which Gemma and Alistair have, have um, covered so well and, and, and the kind of a whole range of things that, that were discussed. Um, and I want to stress that in the report, those recommendations are reported verbatim. So we've made a few kind of grammatical tweaks just to make it flow with the report, but ultimately the, those recommendations are the words of the council members at the end of the process. So really is the heart of the findings of, of this project. Um, but, but something else we do in the report is we also give a bit of an exploration of the discussions that led to those recommendations and the key topics and concerns and questions um, that, that came up through the, the, those many hours of deliberation. And as I say, Gemma and Alistair have spoken about them at length, so I, I won't go into detail myself, but to whistle through some of those topics, there were questions of proportionality and justification. So when and where is it okay to use biometrics? There were discussions around choice, trust and transparency. You know, how can or should people be able to opt into or out of these technologies a concern that, that, that Gemma and Alistair both spoke to? Um, this question of bias, accuracy and discrimination, how might these systems perpetuate systemic injustices in societies? But on, on the other hand, how might these systems be able to be used positively to increase inclusivity or access and prevent stereotyping that human identification checkers, you know, people checking IDs or making judgments about people, those stereotypes that humans can make, where can these systems ameliorate those or where do they exacerbate those? Um, and of course, cutting through all of those themes was, was data protection and data rights. And uh, as I say, there's, there's, there's much more on all of that in the report, which I I encourage everyone to grapple with. Um, as I say, I want to make time for the, for the questions, so I will just end by um, sharing the three kind of conclusions that we at the Ada Lovelace Institute think the Council's recommendations point towards. Um, and the first one is developing more comprehensive legislation and regulation for biometric technologies. The second is establishing independent authoritative body um, to provide robust oversight. And the third is ensuring minimum standards for the design and the deployment of biometric technologies. To us, those are the three things that the um, Council's recommendations all point towards. Um, so I'll wrap up there and I will say thank you again so much to, to Alistair, to Gemma and to Ali for, for taking part in this session and in the Council. And I look forward to discussion. Thank you so much. It's been really thoughtful. I mean, to be honest, um, the range of questions we have in, in the Q&A just do justice to, to the quality of all your contribution. Um, so I'm going to start with one of, one of them. Um, and uh, so John Julian is a UX designer, and he wants to know what the role um, for these sorts of um, approaches might be in terms of shaping um, the design and the development of technologies, essentially. Uh, that's at least how I'm reading that question. So I'm going to ask... Um, I'm going to ask Aidan and then I just want um, uh, Gemma maybe to to come in on 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 her perspective of how developers might might be able to interact using these sorts of approaches. So Aidan, first you and then Gem Gemma and then we'll move on to the next question. Thanks. I, I think that's a great question and there's absolutely a space um, for, for these kinds of methods to be used in, in sort of user design. I think one of the things I often, I mean, my, my knowledge of user design is limited, but I often think there are processes where you have a team of technology developers coming up with an idea for a project, testing, exploring, um, getting quite far along in development and then going out to, to users um, and, and note the term users to then see you know, how that product can be used to make it easier for users to engage with, or, you know, does, does the button here, does that work better, or should it be up there, or should, should, should we use a blue background or a green background? I'm, it's a crude um, reduction of what the complexity of, of, of um, user experience and user design, but I guess one of the things that more deliberative methods can do is shift that engagement with people earlier in the process, so rather than um, testing a product with people, you can include people in deciding what a product should do, what are the aims of it, what do people actually need, you know, in setting the incentives and the agenda for product design, people um, with, can bring their own experience to that and that lends a, an incredible amount of information so that you're not just tweaking products later down the line but you're designing um, you're designing products with people's needs at their very heart and I, so that's one opportunity I think for, for user design but yeah I'm sure Gemma will have some really thoughts really thoughtful things to say on this as well. Yeah thank you so it would be to sort of say similar to yourself Aidan so what we would sort of be recommending as an organisation, as in 
from a disabled persons organization that says is if you want to sort of make your technology inclusive of these people get them in right from the very beginning because what you find is once it's sort of started once you start doing it at the end then you have to go back and then come back and then go back and then come back whereas if you get them in right from the very beginning then they you get the richness of the views and you get the needs you get their access you get everything right from the very beginning um, and I think lending yourself to do that with every sort of technology is a good place to then sort of lead your other technology off with because what you find is if you make it more accessible for disabled people it actually becomes more accessible for non-disabled people as well. Um, and I wondered while, while we're talking about that Eric uh, had a question which is about how the move to online workshops impacted upon participants in the groups and particularly impacted upon um, uh, people whose uh, views were traditionally underrepresented and minority groups and um, wondered whether you had any reflections on that, the sort of online, offline benefits and strengths, but also weaknesses. Me or Alistair, sorry. Sorry. Um, I said me or Alistair, who are you asking that to then, sorry. Um, so, so you and then I'll come to Alistair. Okay, sorry, thank you. Um, so yeah, I really liked wow. being um, in person. So we had a really nice community space in Manchester um, where it was just an amazing building. I really loved that building and it really yeah. felt like you were a team of people in the building. Um, but then sort of moving online, I personally found this a lot better during the pandemic because um, it meant that I wasn't putting myself at any risk by engaging with this product, uh, this sort of project, um, but I could still engage with this project from my own home and from my own comforts. So I didn't feel like I was missing out on anything, if that makes any sense. It feels like I was still able yeah. to fully participate yeah. and fully engage, yeah. but just in a completely different yeah. setting to how we were set up before. I did think the sort of online, pro sorry, the uh, in-person provided more space to chat with different oh, people. Say, yeah. However, yeah, the I online was run very well in the sense of we had breakout rooms and in the breakout yeah, rooms, involved. we would only have say five or six yeah, people yeah. in the breakout rooms. And then we go back to the main session where there could be 50 people in the main session. Um, so it was very difficult yeah, to talk in the main very session, very but then when we went into breakout rooms, that's where we could really delve into our own personal thoughts and opinions. Thank you. And Alistair, I wondered whether you had anything to add to that. And I was going to say, no, nothing really much to add. I think Gem has summed it up perfectly, I think. And I, I do think that the online, uh, when we came online, it did work out perfectly, really. The breakout rooms where you could actually explain more or elaborate more than you could do in the bigger rooms, definitely. So I think it worked really well. It worked really seamlessly, I think, moving from in-person to online, definitely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so we've got a question from James Arbuthna, who um, is asking about the value of consent. And um, so, you know, the, his, his question is really, is consent truly meaningful um, in, in a context where we may not have time, knowledge, understanding or patience, and sometimes um, uh, there might be a bit of a false reassurance from the way uh, some platforms are designed that, that we we know what we're signing up to. Um, so Ali, I'm going to, to point that your way, given the, the, the relevance and the, the centrality of consent to various elements of, of, of um, information commission legislation, but also I'm going to come back to Alistair and Gemma to unpack a little bit more this question of, of consent and its role in, in, in uh, a modern society. So, so Ali, um, do, do you have any responses or reflections um, on, on that question? Thank you for the question. And if I may, I, I want to answer it by first picking up on points that Gemma and Alistair made in their sort of um, uh, points. I think Gemma was talking about the fact that there are, there's huge value to some of these technologies and, you know, trying to find and reconcile how do you get all the benefits, but, you know, try and making sure that bias and discriminatory effects aren't, don't impact marginalized groups or communities or minority groups like mine. 
I think was really powerful and really important. And I think Alistair also talking about the fact that this data, this information is your information. These technologies then process your information and then companies and other organizations can do things with that. And what are the controls around that? I think was really important to come through as well. And at the heart of that, as they were sort of giving their points, what was striking me is that, do we trust what's happening right now? And I feel like in, in the deliberations and the discussions and the report, the answer is probably overall, no, we don't. We don't really trust that our biometric data is being handled with care, is uh, that our permissions and our control and our consent is included, that we understand what's gonna happen next with that data and that we understand what it might mean for us in the longer term. And I think we need that trust to make sure we don't lose all of the benefits that might come from this. So how do you deal with that? And I think here's where I'm gonna come onto the consent point. I think part of this is about just transparency around what is happening. So where is this technology or these technologies being used? Why are they being used? How are they being used? What is going to happen with that data? What are the short-term implications for how that data is being used in the here and now, also of the longer term? I think that transparency then links to accountability, right? So how do you hold any organization or any individual body that is handling this data accountable for what they are doing? But at the start of that, and at the heart of that, has to be this question around, do we feel like we have any agency over this, right? Do we have a sense of permission giving? Should we have a sense of permission giving? And I think absolutely, yes, this is our information. Now, that permission giving doesn't have to be always direct, right? Your rights are there in, in legislation and are protected, and there are bodies like the ICO that are there to make sure your rights are protected. But there are also moments where you should have the right to give consent around what you did, what is happening with your data. So I think to make it meaningful, and I think that was the point about the question, is it really meaningful? I think part of that is about making sure we are lifting understanding across the board in the same way that Gemma at the beginning of this process was saying, and Alistair, they didn't know a huge amount, but they're now the point where they can argue with BBC radio shows about this. I think there's a fantastic level of, of understanding going there. But alongside that, making sure everyone is aware of what's happening with their data, Businesses and bodies have to be really clear about how they ask for your permission. It has to be meaningful in the way it's designed. And I think that's where we need to do more work. Thank you. And I just want to pick up on your point, which is about the rights um, uh, relating to consent and come back to Alistair and, and Gemma and ask them about what came up in their discussions when it came to the right to consent. So what did you think was, was really interesting in, in your discussions around that? Alistair first and then Gemma? Yeah, I, I think, yeah, it is important to get people's right, you know, consent to actually, you know, give the, your biometrics to a company, say. But then I think it also needs to be in simplified English as well, rather than doing uh, legal jargon where people are confused and what they have to agree to. So I think consent is important, but it also needs to simplify so people can actually understand where and what their inf where their data is going to go. That's what I think. And, and Gemma? Yeah, so something that really stood out to me in this one, um, I was from the Manchester group, by the way, I forgot to mention that before. Um, but in my sort of Manchester group, one of our participants said with regarding consent and rights, the analogy about putting a frog into cold water in a pan. And then if you turn the water up in the pan, the frog's not going to jump out and it's going to burn before it realises it's actually really hurt yeah. itself. And we thought about that in relation to consent and rights. And we thought about, well, does it really matter about our consent and rights and stuff? But then we sort of had a look into it. And yeah, it does matter. You know, a lot of the time people do give up their rights for ease of access. But we, we had this whole discussion of sort of privacy versus ease of access and what would be... I don't know, you know, like sometimes you go on a website and you just accept cookies because you just want to get on that website and get on it quickly. But then sometimes you reject the cookies because you've got a little bit more time and you've got a little bit more sort of free space to do that. And what we just sort of say is that we'd hope that biometrics would be able to adopt something like that, but also make it a little bit more clear than sort of 
accepting cookies and things like that, because that does come in the gobbledygook language, like Alistair was saying. And sometimes you can look at that and go, I don't even know what I'm agreeing to here, but I'll just agree to it because I just want to get on this page. But really, if you looked in that terms and conditions, it could say you sell your life off to somebody. It could say that you, you know, you let somebody come and hack into your computer and sit there and watch you all day. And we're just agreeing to that. So I think it is really important consent. And that's something that came out of the Biometrics Council as well. Thank you. And um, fogs in boiling water, love it. Um, Aidan, you might have some reflections on that on that um, that discussion, but also Ed Bridges um, asks how Ada will be taking forward these recommendations into something that the UK government and um, where relevant the devolved governments can implement into policy. So, um, Aidan, I think I think you can you can answer this question, which is what what are we going to do with this report? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm very glad Gemma mentioned the quote about frogs and boiling water, because that's uh, one of those really rich um, visual kind of stories that, that came out of out of the discussion. Um, yeah, great question. So so um, the Citizens Biometrics Council is a project that we've been working on as part of a kind of bigger suite of work at the Ada Lovelace Institute on biometrics technologies. Um, so as I mentioned before, we, we in 2019, we called for the moratorium and we ran the survey. In early 2020, we then hosted um, an event event um, around um, facial recognition and regulation around biometrics technologies in the UK. That was very early on. Shortly after that event, the Citizens Biometrics Council kicked off and concurrently to the Citizens Biometrics Council, we've also commissioned an independent legal review of the governance of biometric data in the UK. And that's being led by um, Matthew Ryder QC, who's a lawyer and, and he, he has a team and, and they're working on that. Um, so as well as the kind of evidence that's been generated by the Citizens Biometrics Council, we will also have evidence from the independent legal review which we'll be publishing later this year um, and the idea is that those those two pieces of evidence will contribute we think contribute quite substantially substantially to the UK landscape around biometric technologies. Um, we've also been alongside this inviting a range of experts and different perspectives to um, write on our blog about this topic. So there's there's all kinds of, um, as, as well as kind of convening this public debate around biometrics, we also have been convening people from all walks of professional uh, life to, to, to share their thoughts on, on biometrics. So um, certainly this isn't the only intervention that we're making into this space, but um, there, there is more to come as well. Thank you. Um, I, I, um, there was one last question which I am going to respond to from Megan Wiley, um, who asked whether there was already a process in place within government to develop regulation around biometrics and around the, the citizen panel and an integral part of that policy process. And um, I think one of the key things that we want to do at the Lovelace Institute is not just to run these, but actually to make the case for um, the value of these in the wider policy landscape. So it's kind of something really interesting about the benefits and the value um, that deliberative processes can, can have um, and, and, and its impacts uh, upon, upon various organisations. There's some really interesting work undertaken by a government programme, led programme, that have been doing this for 15 years plus, um, such as science-wise, and we're running a, a, a dialogue, and a dialogue on the ethics of location data with with ScienceWise and um, so there are institutional framework to Megan's question around um, undertaking thoughtful dialogue and deliberation with members of the public and um, increasingly they're becoming more and more prominent. So you've got the Bank of England for instance that endorsed um, citizens councils regionally across, across the UK. So I think this is very much um, part of a broader uh, trend um, towards accelerated adoption of these sorts of processes and, and very much a broader trend around how do we bring people um, uh, together with a range of uh, perspectives and experts in order to improve the quality of, of the conversation that we have about the future. Um, and, and I think that that's probably a really good um, note upon which to end, um, end this. And, and really to say thank you so much to Alistair, Gemma, Ali and Aidan, and also to you for your excellent um, uh, questions. Uh, there's a few few left. Always a, a, a mark of a good conversation, and, and we'll do our best to get back to you on on your particular question. So, um, thank you very much. And um, uh, I just want to remind you that we've just popped a link in the chat that the report is now live. Aidan's mentioned the wider review, so there's more coming out on regulation in this space shortly um, and we also have a survey that we would like to ask you to complete who are 
on behalf of Earthless Consulting who are evaluating um, us. So um, please complete the survey because it will uh, help us understand how to do these sorts of events better and differently in future. Um, we'd, we'd really appreciate your time in doing that. Thank you so much for all your excellent feedback. And um, I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful afternoon. Take care.